So I want to start out with uh, just one of the most remarkable stories I've ever heard before. Well, it makes it so remarkable that it's true. You, you would never think that this story is true. You'd think this is something that Hollywood came up with. But it's about a man. I'm not going to even try to pronounce his name because he's from the country of Hungary. But as a young man uh, in his 20s, he started this political action uh, movement, this group that was anti-Semitic, that the whole purpose was to hate Jewish people. And they were, they were anti-Semitic. They were anti-immigration. It was, it was kind of like a... Uh, uh, a white power, that skinhead type of movement, and all his followers would wear these uh, military uniforms with, with the armbands, and they kind of emulated Nazism and Adolf, Adolf Hitler. In fact, he, he, uh, he declared that the, the, that, the, um, that the Holocaust was a fraud, that it never happened, and he was just f- filled with hate, and he hated Jewish people. What makes this story so remarkable is that one day he got an email from a newspaper reporter who had been sniffing around in this guy's family history and discovered, guess what? He's Jewish. He's Jewish. In fact, he had, he, had, um, he had won a, this is what's amazing, on this anti-Jewish platform, he had won a seat to, their, to, the, to the Hungarian parliament. He actually was in their parliament on this platform of anti-Semitic, Jew-hating platform and come to find out he's Jewish himself. And so he's, he's like, oh, this can't be true. You know, this can't be true. So he meets with this newspaper reporter and because uh, he thinks this has got to be some kind of joke. And the newspaper reporter presents to him the absolute evidence, family history, that yes, indeed, he himself is Jewish. Now, you got to ask, how did he not know he's Jewish, right? How could he not know this? This is what happened. His grandmother was, an, was a survivor of Auschwitz. In fact, she was the only survivor of her whole entire family. 30 family members were killed. Extended family, immediate family. She was the only one who survived Auschwitz. And she came out of that experience so ashamed of being Jewish and so ashamed of having been in Auschwitz that she, she, she converted to Catholicism to hide her tracks. And she always wore long sleeve shirts to cover up the tattoos that they would get you know, with the numbers in Auschwitz. And she, it was her secret. Her whole family had no idea that they were Jewish. So you can, can you imagine from her, her perspective, her, her grandson coming up with this ideology that inflicted so much pain and loss on his grandmother's life, and she kept it quiet. And so, so he, he sees the evidence that, in fact, he is Jewish, this, this Jew-hating guy. He himself is Jewish. And obviously, there's, there's a conflict there, you know, with his conscience of, of what to do with this information. And so he tries to keep it quiet. And that's the name of the documentary about his life, Keep Quiet. And, uh, and he, he, he's, he has to come to this place of reckoning of, of his past, of persecuting the very people who biologically, you know, DNA-wise, that's who he was. And he reached out to, the, to this rabbi um, and, and to try to make sense of all this. And this rabbi took him under his wings and began to mentor him and disciple him and to teach him the Torah. And, and he went on a, on a, a trip to Auschwitz. Even, even during this time, he still didn't think that the Holocaust had happened. So he went and he visited Auschwitz. Auschwitz. He saw the crematoriums where 30 members of his own family had been cremated. And it broke in him. And he realized the lie that he had been living for all those years, and he actually converted to Orthodox Judaism under the influence of this rabbi. And uh, this rabbi gave him a, a mandate. He said, now that you know the truth, I want, you to, I want you to travel the world and tell your story of what anti-Semitism has done did to your life and what's done to the history of the Jews. And I want you to talk about who you were before and who you were after. And I want you to educate people and tell people about the change in your life. And that's what he does today. He travels the world talking about who he was before, his old identity, talking about who's his new identity, and what the change has happened in his life. Does that sound familiar? Because that's, that's you and I. That, that's the mandate of you and I to talk about who we were before Christ and who we are after Christ and the change that has been made in our lives and to tell people that's our mandate. Now, if you're like me, I was raised in the church. You know, I was a pastor's kid. I was about eight years old when I came to know Jesus. So it's, I really have a hard time having a before picture and an after picture, you know, of, of Jesus. And so, but that's when you're thinking with your flesh. 
But if we look at ourselves in the spirit, who we are spiritually outside of Christ, then it's going to paint a really stark picture, whether you're 8 or 80. And that's what we're going to talk about today, because when, when we come to Christ, there, there should be a change in our behavior, especially when it comes to treating other people who are not like us. And that is the mandate, and that is the challenge that James in chapter 2 presents to us. That if you identify with Jesus Christ, and it should have a direct impact on your behavior and how you treat other people, especially when it comes to prejudiced behavior and, and being, showing favoritism. And that's what he addresses. And so let's start with chapter 2. And like I said, his his. His, his, uh, his tone kind of amps up a little bit here, and he kind of challenges people in his writing. He says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, You stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourself and become judges with your evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Forever who keeps the whole law yet stumbles at one just point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. And if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who's not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. And so I was looking at this, ver- this, this passage of Scripture this week, and I, and I saw a sequence that very much parallels that young man's life. You know, we have a, a before picture, we have an after picture, and then we have this mandate that we are to be the hands and feet of Jesus and how we interact and treat other people. And so, so it looks like this. It's our identity. He addresses us as our identity. He talks about our character. He gives this mandate, and then he gives a warning, a very stark warning at the end for those who would fail to live up to this. And so we're going to start with, with that one, with, and it's our identity, it should affect our character, and our character should affect our mandate, and our mandate is to love your neighbor as yourself. So we're going to start with our identity. He says this, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that seems like just kind of like a generic title, doesn't it, or a generic greeting. But in that is so much there that we don't quite realize because you know, we live in a country, to be a Christian is, is kind of, um, just kind of like this big umbrella of a term that, doesn't, that means a lot of different things to a lot of people, you know? A lot of people who say they're Christians, when it comes right down to it, you ask what they really believe, eh, they're not really Christians, you know? It's just a title. It's just something that they grew up with, you know? My parents are Christians, therefore, I'm a Christian. So let's talk about what it means to have an identity in Christ, that when you are a believer in Jesus, that means that there is a before picture and there's an after picture. In the before picture, I have it in your, in your bulletin. We were foreigners, but have become citizens. We were enemies that have been rescued, reconciled. We were lawbreakers, but have been forgiven. We were lost, but have been found. We were poor, but have been made spiritually rich. We were orphans that have been adopted and made heirs. That's, that's our identity, before and after. Okay, that's our before identity, and that's our after identity. So I want to take these. I want, you, I, want to, I want to really hammer this into your mind because this influences our behavior and how we treat other people if we realize what our identity was before Christ. And so we're going to take these real quick, these scriptures. So let's start with this one. We were foreigners but have become citizens. It says, it says in uh, Ephesians 2, Therefore remember that that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth, that's you and I, that you were separated from Christ, 
excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, what this means is that God chose Israel to be the chosen people, right? They, they were the heirs to the kingdom and everybody else was on the in, outside looking in. They were separate from God. I'll give you a, a, just a, kind of a modern parallel. Just, you know, the, the whole immigration issue right now is, is a hot topic. So imagine that we are, we are immigrants at the southern border looking in and we can't, are not allowed in, okay? We were foreigners to God. We were spiritual foreigners but because of Christ, we have now become citizens of the kingdom of God. We were enemies, but have now been reconciled. <clears throat> it says in Colossians 1, Once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in, his, in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Isn't that good news? We were enemies, but have been reconciled. We were lawbreakers, but have been forgiven. 1 John 3, 4, 4 says, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. lawlessness. But you know he appeared so that he might take away our sins. We were lawbreakers. And so when you see that prisoner in prison, you may not be able to relate to him in a physical sense, but think spiritually. You are a lawbreaker. We were lost. They've been found. Jesus said to, to uh, uh, of, uh, Nicodemus, today salvation has come to his house because this man is a, too is a man of, uh, son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek to save the lost. That's you and I. We were poor that have been made spiritually rich. 2 Corinthians 2, 8, 9 says, For you know that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And finally, we were orphans been adopted and made heirs. Romans 8, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father, which means Daddy. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then uh, we are, if, now if we were our children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Those are passages of scripture that everyone should know because it speaks to who we were before Christ and who we were after Christ, who we are after Christ. And so this is what it looks like. We are foreigners, we're enemies, we're lawbreakers, we were lost, we were poor, we were orphans. But God reconciled all of that. And I want you to look at that picture right there of all those that we wore because this is the problem with the middle class and upper class church is that we, on a physical sense, we can't relate to that, can we? That's not our experience. We're not foreigners. We're not enemies. We're not lawbreakers. We're not lost. We're certainly not poor, and we're certainly not orphans. So when we approach someone who fits that description physically, we have a hard time connecting, don't we? We have a hard time relating to someone who fits that description. And that's why I wanted to hammer in your head, spiritually, that's who we were before Christ. And we have to take who we were spiritually and try to connect with people who are that way physically. That way we have a way to connect with them. And that way we have a reason to be Christ to them. I was thinking about this with, um, with the, the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus chose that story to shame the, the social elite. You know, the, the man fell in the hand of robbers and he was left half dead. And uh, the social elite walked by and they didn't help. But who helped him? The guy who was at the bottom of the social barrel. You know, the, the Samaritan, the one who himself had been despised and probably spat upon and called names because that's what Jewish people did to the Samaritans. Now I got to thinking, maybe the reason he got off his donkey and helped him because he himself had probably been a victim himself. He knew it was like to be victimized and he saw the victim there and, and, and he had mercy on him because he could relate to him. And so this is why I want to hammer home this morning. It's like we have to put our minds in the spiritual mindset of that's who we are outside of Christ. We are foreigners, enemies, lawbreakers, lost, poor, and orphaned people. And we have to think of ourselves that way because when we approach someone who physically represents that, we have to have that understanding to connect with them so that we can relate to them. This is what it says in Leviticus 19. This is what God tells Israel. He says, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as a native born. Love them as yourselves, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. 
So God is saying you need to connect. You need to have some kind of way to connect to this foreigner. And the way to connect to him is to remember who you were before I chose you. You yourselves were foreigners. So going back to that list, we have to look at this list and say, that's who we are outside of Christ. Even though we may not represent physically, but that's who we are spiritually. And that's our point of entry to connect to people who physically represent that. We have to relate to them. Our identity before and our identity after leads to a character transformation when we realize who we are in Christ. And James deals with this. He says, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. We must not show favoritism. I want to show you um, the scripture, John, John 13 Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Our, our calling card, the way that people know who we are, is by the way we treat other people, regardless of who they are, regardless if they're a foreigner, or an enemy, or a lawbreaker, or lost, or poor, or orphans. When we're rooted in Christ, we act like Christ. When we're rooted in ourselves, we act like ourselves, uh, like the flesh when it comes to people. And I want to show you this, this graphic. I, a friend of mine showed me this, and I loved it. If we're rooted in Christ, we, the fruit of the, our lives reflect it. When it comes to those people, that list of people I just mentioned, we're welcoming, we're selfless, we're polite, we protect them, we're humble, we're hopeful, we're kind, we're forgiving, because that's who Christ was to us. But when we're rooted in ourselves, there's no fruit there other than the bitter fruit of the flesh. We grumble against those people. We're bitter against them. We're prideful because look how special we are and look how unspecial they are. We're prejudiced against them. We're slanderous. We're rude. And we hate them. Our identity in Christ has to uh, affect our character so that we treat people in the way that Christ treated us. And someone who's rooted in Christ will, will not show favoritism. They will not be prejudiced. Someone who's rooted in Christ will act the way that Christ acted toward the foreigner and the enemy and the lost and the poor and the orphan and the marginalized. But someone rooted in themselves will snub their noses at such people and neglect the needs of the poor, and neglect the needs of those people and justify it by saying they deserve what they get, forgetting all along that we were once foreigners and we were once lost and we were once orphans spiritually. We were once the enemy of God, and he did all that to reconcile us. The least we can do is pass it on, right? Because that's the mandate of Scripture, to pass on, to treat others the way that Christ treated us. So I ask you, who are you rooted in? Are you rooted in Christ when it comes to the, the poor and the needy and the foreigner and the lawbreakers and the prisoners and the orphans? Or are you rooted in yourself? Let that be a challenge to your heart. That leads to, that leads to our, our mandate, our mandate. James says in verse 8, if you really keep the, the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Our mandate is to be Jesus to people, to love them as Christ loved them, to love your neighbor as yourself. The royal law as James puts it. And we, and we look at Scripture, and we have two mandates. We have a personal mandate, and we have a church mandate, okay, of how we are to treat other people in this regard. So I want to start with the personal mandate. It's found in Hebrews 13, 1 through 3. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters, James, uh, the writer of Hebrews says. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if yourselves were suffering. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, make a personal connection there. Even if you're not a prisoner, act like you're one. So that way, that's you way you connect with them and can minister to them. If, you're suff if someone's suffering or mistreated, try to put yourselves in their shoes. That way you can be Jesus to them. That's our personal mandate, and that's why I'm hammering home this, this identity thing of who we were before Christ, because we were the prisoner. We were the one who was being mistreated. We were the orphans. We were the poor. 
spiritually speaking, to God. And the least we can do, and what our mandate is, is to pass that on to people who physically represent that. That's our personal mandate. But then there's a church mandate. Ephesians 3, Paul says, although I am, the, the, although I am less than the least of all God, Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. What's the purpose of the church? To show the manifold wisdom, the, the boundless riches of Christ to the world. That's our mandate. To be Jesus to the foreigner, to the enemy, to the lawbreaker, to the lost, to the poor, and to the orphans. And I love churches that have prison ministries. I, the last church that I came from, they have a prison ministry for, where men go into the prisons and they, and they just be Jesus to people. I know personally people who have adopted children who have been abandoned by their parents to the foster system because they're being Jesus to those poor children who have been so disadvantaged because I know the motivating factor is that that's who we are without Christ. And we have to be Jesus to the people who physically represent who we are spiritually outside of Christ. And one of the things that kept this, this word kept coming to my mind this week, that one of the things that prevents the church from doing this is this word called tribalism. Tribalism, okay? This is what tribalism looks like. Tribalism is it's a loyalty to one's own tribe or social group to the point that the dogma and dysfunction become the standard. And so I have a picture of there two people in an argument, you know, and there's some divide between them, and one's saying, I'm right and you're wrong, the other one's saying, I'm right and you're wrong. And, and unfortunately, through the history of the church, tribalism has been there from the very beginning. That's why we have a thousand different denominations, isn't it? You know, because the, instead of working their, their differences out, they decide to go their own separate ways and look down upon each other. But where I see tribalism rear its ugly head, and this is where I'm going to maybe be hidden close to home, is when we, was when we combine tribalism with nationalism. When we combine, combine tribalism with nationalism, where we say anybody who's not American, somebody who doesn't subscribe to the American way, you know, we look down upon them. And that is, unfortunately, what I see happening in our church, especially with this whole discussion of illegal immigration. It, that we've taken on this attitude that, that we are above someone who's not like us, who's not American, who's, who's not, who will not subscribe to the American way. And tribalism cuts at the heart of Jesus and the message of the gospel. I had this thought. You know where tribalism began? I believe that tribalism began at the Tower of Babel because God gave this mandate that they would be fruitful and spread out. And what, what did they do? They did the opposite. They all hunkered down all together in one place. And they got this idea. They, they shared a, a common language. They shared a common culture. And then they got this idea to do something to make themselves great. And, and, and thus the beginning of nationalistic pride, of tribalism, of prejudicism. But God, who opposes the proud, saw fit to dismantle their plans. And, and out of that one people came many diverse groups. And ever since then, sinful man has been trying to get back to Babel, haven't they? They've been trying to get back to Babel, where nationalism and tribalism and racism, these are man's attempt to get back to Babel, where one people group claims superiority over, the, over another, to make themselves great and to, and to curse some other group who doesn't agree exactly the way they do. But the gospel of Jesus Christ undercuts the spirit of Babel. And we see this in Acts chapter 2 where the Holy Spirit is poured upon the church, is poured upon people from every nationality and every language because that's God's plan. Diversity is God's plan. We see diversity in the, in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're equal, but they're separate in their functions. Di diversity is God's plan for mankind. And tying nationalistic pride with Christianity is a dangerous mix, mix because it fuels tribalism and it undercuts the message of Christ by making villains of anyone who doesn't subscribe to our way. That's not the message of the cross. 
The Lord's church must be the agent of reconciliation. We must be, we must be the antidote to tribalism. And when we, when we allow tribalism into the church to where we have this attitude of superiority, we are, we are undercutting the message of Jesus Christ that says that all people are welcomed. Let that be a challenge because James gives us this warning. He says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The reason we're here is because mercy triumphed over judgment. You know, God is just in his judgment, but he allowed mercy to override. So I know, well, what about those immigrants? No, 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 mercy triumphs over judgment. What about those Democrats? No, mercy triumphs over judgment. What about those gay people? No, mercy triumphs over judgment because mercy triumphed over judgment for you and I. Now, I'm not saying that we, that we can't stand up for truth, but we can't have this tribalistic mentality where, where we villainize people because they're different. We must be Jesus to people in the way we treat them. Especially the foreigner, the enemy, the lawbreaker, the lost, the poor, and the orphan. And Jesus gave this really stark warning in Matthew 25. This is the one that makes you shudder. He said this, Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whoever did not do this for the one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Our mandate is to be Jesus to the world, to the sick, to the prisoner, to the orphan, to the foreigner. And we have to, we have to do this with humility, putting aside all kind of pride that, that makes us believe that we're superior, superior to other people. It's important that we recognize our old identity of who we are outside of Christ and the amazing love of God to rescue us because it's only then that we're able to make a connection between our old self and the people who physically represent that, the poor and the marginalized person standing there in front of us. And when we neglect them, and we neglect them, we are forgetting what God has done for us, which is such an affront to God that he gives this warning to us. No wonder James sends such a stern Warning. I want to close by showing you this graphic. I came across this just last night on, on, online, and I thought it was so beautiful. It was so perfect. We, you know, we, we hear the phrase, put Christ back into Christmas, or put Christ back into Christianity. You want to know how you do that? Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Forgive 70 times 7. Whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Feed the hungry. Don't return evil for evil. Visit those in prison. Clothe the naked. House the homeless. Welcome the foreigner. Don't judge. Care for the sick. Love one another as Jesus has loved you. Those are the words of Christ. That's our mandate. That's our mandate. To be Jesus. And, and, it, and it requires us to love God more than ourselves and to be rooted in the character of Christ and not in our flesh that wants to be, create all this separation and create all this division. Unity and love is the hallmark of Christ. Let that be a challenge, okay? Let that be a challenge. I know this is a challenge, especially in this political season where the, where the, uh, the verbiage that's being used and, and the, the, generate, the, the words that are spoken against foreigners is, is causing this nationalistic pride in us, but we have to. It's okay to be, a, to be proud to be American. Now, every country is proud to be of where they're from, but to, to, to uh, influence that and to mix that with our faith is a dangerous faith that leads to a version of Christianity that's not true to Christ. Whew. Please receive that with love, because I'm saying it in love, okay? Amen. Let's pray. So God, I pray, Lord, um, that you, our hearts are receptive to this, Lord, that this is a reminder 
that this is a reminder, Lord, that who we wore before Christ, that to you, Jesus, to you, God, we wore the foreigner, we wore the enemy, we wore the lawbreaker, and the lost, and the poor, and the orphans, but we have been made rich, we've become citizens, we've been reconciled, we've been forgiven, we have been found, we've been made heirs because of Christ. And the least we can do, Lord, the very least we can do is pass that love and that grace on to people who physically represent that. Let that be our mandate, God, because it is our mandate. Let that be our challenge, because it is our challenge. And let that become our, our mindset, the mindset of Christ, to love as Christ is loved, because that's how people will know that we are His disciples. Oh, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.